Okay, so uh, I want to continue on a little bit talking about um, how muscles contract uh, sort of at the molecular level, how these proteins interact. Um, so the animation I was showing you a little bit ago gets at the basic process here that we have thick filaments and thin filaments that overlap. And the thick filaments have a motor piece that moves and it slides the thin filament across the thick filament. That shortens a sarcomere. Now these sarcomeres are just repeating units throughout the entire myofibril, which is the cytoskeletal element of the um, uh, muscle cell. And so all of the sarcomeres are contracting all together, and so the whole muscle cell contracts as one. Um, but it's all based on what's happening with these um, uh, muscle proteins in the fibers. So I want to talk a little bit more about uh, those, um, what's happening there. And I want to go to this picture. This is out of, oh, I should show you where it's from. Um, the part I was just showing you before about the structure of the muscle as an organ and the structure of muscle cells themselves, we're in the skeletal muscle section. And then the next section says muscle fiber contraction and relaxation. And so this is where it's explaining, uh, I'm going to skip this part here. You can read it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this next week because it's about how the nervous system uh, controls this stuff. Um, <clears throat> and this is where they talk about the sliding filament. So this is the boring static picture, which the animation I showed you about a little bit ago is illustrated. Okay. So the thin filaments are stretched apart from each other, and then they slide towards the middle and the sarcomere shortens, sliding filament. It's powered by these little motor parts of the myosin protein. Um, and how they work runs through a cycle. Uh, there's four parts to the cycle, which are highlighted here. Um, and it's powered by ATP. When ATP is hydrolyzed, one of the phosphates is removed, and you get ADP and uh, an inorganic phosphate. So at the top there, that's what we see. ADP means adenosine diphosphate, so it's lost a phosphate. And then P with the subscript I means inorganic phosphate. Okay. A phosphate is phosphorus and oxygen. There's no carbon, so it's an inorganic molecule. That's why it's called inorganic phosphate. When we hydrolyze ATP, that's what it breaks down into. So at the start of this cycle, what we call the cross-bridge cycle, um, the ADP, I mean, the ATP has already been hydrolyzed. Okay? When that hydrolysis takes place, energy is released from the ATP, which is going to power movement of um, the myosin motor unit, what, the motor piece, what's called the uh, head. Um, and so... Uh, <coughs> What has to happen is myosin and actin have to physically interact, bind together. The uh, myosin head, which we're talking about here, is going to uh, bind to actin, which are these green uh, beads here. The little dark spot represents a spot where myosin binds to actin. Actin is just a chain of these beads, and it's two chains wound around each other, kind of like a double-stranded necklace. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so myosin will attach to that. That's what we call formation of a cross bridge. And then the energy from hydrolysis of ATP powers the physical movement of the myosin head, so it'll bend and that's going to physically move the thin filament in one direction. Okay. When that happens, it releases ADP and the inorganic phosphate. Um, so after it's done that, which is called the power stroke, um, it'll release the actin because it's done sliding it along. It'll grab a new ATP molecule, and it'll return back to its previous position. 
which is what we see here. And as it's doing that, it'll hydrolyze the ATP again. Okay. So in the book, they call that the cocking of the myosin head. Sort of like you, know, you have a gun and you cock the gun ready to fire again. Not my choice of words there. Um, <clears throat> so these four events, um, I think, are best summarized as this. So this is called the cross bridge, uh, cross bridge cycle. Step one is ah, cross bridge. I cannot type anymore. Bridge formation. That's when myosin binds to actin. Step two is called the power stroke. Now, this is actually a term that applies to any kind of engine. Okay, When your car is making you move forward, a little bit of gasoline is ignited by a spark from the spark plug, and that explosion pushes the piston in the cylinder, uh, I guess down would be the way to say it. Um, and the piston is attached to the drivetrain, and it makes the drivetrain rotate, which drives the transmission. Okay. Quick lesson in internal combustion engines. But with that explosion of gasoline in the cylinder, the movement of the piston, that's called the power stroke. Okay. Um, so this is just a general term that applies to any kind of motor. The third part is cross bridge detachment. So myosin lets go of actin. And then the fourth part, which the book calls cocking of the myosin head or whatever, I prefer to call that the recovery stroke. Um, <clears throat> again, power stroke is what we call um, the part of uh, an engine's uh, <clears throat> business, I don't know what I'm trying to say there, um, that's causing the movement. So when gasoline is sparked by the spark plug and explodes, it pushes the, the piston down, that's the power stroke for your car's engine. Okay. Um, for the car, after that happens, the piston's going to move back up to its original position. That's what we call the recovery stroke. Okay. So power stroke and recovery stroke are just two terms that we use when we're talking about any kind of motor or engine. Okay. Now, I like to kind of illustrate this with um, a less mechanical engine. Okay. So let's pretend this is a canoe paddle. Okay. And I'm going to canoe along like this. What I'm doing with this paddle is what we've got right there. Okay. So I put the paddle in the water. That's cross bridge formation. Okay. I'm connecting the paddle to the water. I push the paddle back and I move forward. That's the power stroke. And I pull the paddle out of the water. That's detachment. Okay. And then I move the paddle forward. That's recovery stroke. And then I put it back in the water. Power stroke, detach, recovery stroke. Attach, power stroke, detach, power stroke. That's what's going on here. Okay. Now, I could describe the workings of an internal combustion engine and explain that's the same thing that's happening in your car, too. But I like the um, canoe paddle example because I think you can see very clearly. Um, now, as I was doing that, I actually was not doing it properly for a well trained canoeist. Okay. Um, after the power stroke and pulling the paddle out of the water, the recovery stroke is not just the opposite of the power stroke. Okay? I would not just take my paddle and move it forward like that. Okay? What you do in canoeing is you turn the paddle sideways and you move it that way. Why would you want to do that? Save energy. Save energy, exactly. Okay. If I move it this way, the flat surface of the paddle is impacting air and I have to spend a little bit more energy to move it forward. But if I rotate it like that, then the, the thin edge of the paddle slices through the air with a lot less resistance. And it's easier to do it. Okay. 
That's what happens in a recovery strip. Okay. For the myosin head, so let's pretend this is a myosin head, it attaches to um, the axon, goes through its power stroke, it detaches, its recovery stroke goes back down like that. So it's below the thin filament. And then it goes back up and attaches, power stroke detaches, recovery stroke. <clears throat> Which is kind of obvious in this picture now that I've pointed it out. Okay, so if we look at this, uh, down here in the last parts, it's moving in a lower position so it never impacts the, the actin again. Now, in this series of pictures, we're only looking at one myosin head, but there's a lot of myosin heads, and they're all doing this. And they're all doing it independently. So there's always going to be at least one myosin head attached to the actin, at least one that's going through a power stroke, at least one that's re uh, detaching, at least one that's going through recovery. So all this is always going on. The thin filament's going to be moved gradually towards the center. It can't move back because it's always going to be attached to myosin. Once all of the myosin uh, detaches, then the thin filaments will slide back, and that's when the muscle relaxes. Okay. So this is constantly happening, um, <clears throat> causing muscle contraction. Again, this is really a dynamic process, and it's a lot easier to make sense of if you can see it in a dynamic um, animation. So I want to show you one for that. Now, I do not have a link to this animation in Blackboard, and there's sort of an ethical reason for me not doing that. Um, the animation I'm about to show you is actually made for the textbook that I'm not asking you to buy. So all of my colleagues teach out of the, the textbook that costs $350 or whatever it is. Um, and with that, the... Uh, <clears throat> Um, student gets access to a website where there are some animations that they can see. Somebody has taken a, some of those animations and posted them on YouTube. Okay. It is copyright infringement. Um, it's not exactly kosher for me to say this, but generally people think that if something's on YouTube and it hasn't been taken down, that's implicit agreement from the people that made it, that they don't mind that it's been, their copyright has been infringed on. Okay. So I'm going to show you this, even though technically it's something that you're supposed to have paid for access to see, because it is on a YouTube and they haven't taken it down. Um, <laughs> but I satisfy this ethical conundrum by not actually giving you a direct link to that. Okay. What I did is I searched on YouTube for sliding film. Now, apparently, um, when you do that, you get a link to the Magical S'mores Treat video, um, which has nothing to do with sliding filaments. But um, there are a few things that have sliding filaments in them. I actually want to go to this um, video here, which its title is Crossbridge Cycle, which is what I just described. What's explained in this um, video is a little bit more than just a crossbridge cycle. But what's great is the company that made this, Pearson, um, they've made a series of really, really good animations. And this is the one regret I have with not having you buy this book. Okay. These animations are spectacular. Um, but I don't think it's worth the money to buy the whole freaking book. Okay. I'm happy to give you this uh, opportunity to not buy an expensive book. And for this, I'm going to show you you know, copyright infringed material on YouTube. There are other very nice uh, animations that talk about all this stuff that we don't have access to. They're not on YouTube. Um, and from that, again, this kind of implicit agreement that Pearson apparently is okay with this being on YouTube probably is because there's more material that you can see. So it's like, hey, your first one's free. You can get to watch this video, but if you want it some more, you got to pay for it. So. If, if you suddenly get addicted to this animation and you need more, you got to pay for it. So, um, but I'm not a pusher or anything like that. So, uh, let me play this. The contraction of a skeletal muscle generates the force necessary to move the skeleton. A contraction is triggered by a series of molecular events 
known as the crossbridge cycle. In a skeletal muscle fiber, the functional unit of contraction is called the sarcomere. A sarcomere shortens when myosin heads and thick myofilaments form cross bridges with actin molecules and thin myofilaments. The formation of a cross bridge is initiated when calcium ions released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum bind to troponin. This binding causes troponin to change shape. Tropomyosin moves away from the myosin binding sites on actin, allowing the myosin head to bind actin and form a cross bridge. Also note that the myosin head must be activated before a cross bridge cycle can begin. This occurs when ATP binds to the myosin head and is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. The energy liberated from the hydrolysis of ATP activates the myosin head, forcing it into the cocked position. A cross bridge cycle may be divided into four steps. Step one, cross bridge formation. The activated myosin head binds to actin, forming a cross bridge. Inorganic phosphate is released and the bond between myosin and actin becomes stronger. Step two, the power stroke. ADP is released and the activated myosin head pivots, sliding the thin myofilament toward the center of the sarcomere. Step three, cross bridge detachment. When another ATP binds to the myosin head, the link between the myosin head and actin weakens and the myosin head detaches. Step four, reactivation of the myosin head. ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. The energy released during hydrolysis reactivates the myosin head, returning it to the cocked position. As long as the binding sites on actin remain exposed, the cross bridge cycle will repeat. And as the cycle repeats, the thin myofilaments are pulled toward each other and the sarcomere shortens. This shortening causes the whole muscle to contract. Cross bridge cycling ends when calcium ions are actively transported back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Troponin returns to its original shape allowing tropomyosin to glide over and cover the myosin binding site on actin. So, um, <clears throat> again, it's a beautiful animation. They show some really good stuff. And it's very accurate representation of what's going on. Now, there are a few things that were presented here which actually I haven't mentioned. Okay, and I've done that somewhat in the interest of time. Um, so let me address those a little bit real quick. Okay, so <clears throat> these purple dots that are floating in are. Uh, I skipped the play, but there is a label, and they're calcium ions. Okay, they're stored inside the muscle cell in what's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. What does that sound like? Sarcoplasmic reticulum. Endo. Endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, it's just the specialized name for the endoplasmic reticulum in the muscle cell. Okay. Sarco means muscle. Now. There are two types of endoplasmic reticulum in cells. What are they? Smooth and rough, right. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is specifically smooth endoplasmic reticulum, okay, which is a storage compartment inside any given cell. 
other cells use it to store calcium also. Some other cells use their smooth endoplasmic reticulum just to store lipids and other sorts of things. But here it's storing calcium. At the beginning of contraction, the calcium ions released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and flood into the cytoplasm of the muscle cell. So that's what we're seeing. These purple dots are calcium ions. What they do is they bind to this thing called troponin which is a protein that's also part of the thin filament, okay? But it's not a whole lot of the thin filament. Most of the thin filaments are all these actins. Okay? Troponin, as you can see, has three pieces. And the calcium binds specifically to one of those pieces. The three pieces are designated as troponin C, troponin T and troponin X. I actually don't know what the last two are, and I don't care. Um, what do you think the C in troponin C stands for? Calcium. Troponin C is specifically this part of troponin that the calcium binds to. The other two parts have their designations, and I don't remember what letters they actually are. If you're interested, you can look it up. I always forget because I don't really care. Um, but the C is specifically the part that binds to calcium. When calcium is bind to, has bound to troponin, troponin changes its shape, and that helps to move this thin green filament called tropomyosin out of the way. Okay, so here's uh, troponin has moved tropomyosin out of the way, which uncovers the binding sites on actin that myosin can bind to. Okay. No calcium, troponin, keeps tropomyosin covering the binding sites, and myosin can't bind to actin. You add calcium, troponin moves tropomyosin out of the way, and myosin and actin can bind. Okay. What that means is you have to have calcium present for contraction to take place. Okay. So that's what they said at the beginning. And then, um, come on, they explain ATP to ADP and the energetic phosphate. Um, and then they sort of go back here and they talk about the cross bridge cycle. And they number the different parts. Cross bridge formation, which I said. Power stroke, which I said. Cross bridge detachment, which I said. And then reactivation of the myosin head, which I called the recovery stroke. Now, I use the term recovery stroke because I was comparing it to any other motor or my canoe paddle thing. Okay. Calling it reactivation of myosin head really kind of gets at, it's about hydrolyzing ATP before the next cycle starts. Okay, So this is a fine alternate way to talk about step four. But I tend to use recovery stroke because I like to compare it to uh, the power stroke in the sense that it's a motor. Okay, So those are the four steps. Um, yada, yada, yada. This is the part that just gives me chills. Okay, I love this sort of flying down the thick filament, seeing all of these myosin heads doing their job. Um, <clears throat> ATP molecules are coming in. They're being hydrolyzed. And ADP and interkinetic phosphate is being released. It's just this, uh, oh, shoot. <clears throat> Will it's just this this lovely little show of that. Also, as this is happening, notice that each of the heads are acting independently. Um, this one is about to form a cross bridge. This one's probably just released a cross bridge. And down here, here's one that's, I think, just hydrolyzed ATP, et cetera, et cetera. So they're all kind of in their own spot within the cycle. Okay. And then we see the whole thing taking place. This is essentially a very uh, well-represented version of that first animation I showed you. Thin filaments sliding across thick filaments until they get to the center, which was actually demonstrated better at the beginning here. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm not going to be able to jump ahead to the exact frame. I'll go too far if I hit the, the advance button. But the thick fil I mean the thin filament from one side and the thin filament from the other side are actually going to overlap in the middle a little bit. 
and that's where that H zone thing disappears. So after all that, they kind of show the same thing again, um, but not in as much detail. And then they do this little thing here where you can again see more of the individual uh, myosin heads, each acting independently. Oh, whoops. There it is. That's the frame where you actually see the thin filaments from either side physically overlapping in the middle. And then what they're talking about here is calcium is uh, cleared out of the cytoplasm, and so it stops binding to, to pronin, and troponin and tropomyosin move back to their original positions, blocking myosin's ability to bind to actin. And when no myosin is bound to actin anymore, then the muscle relaxes and everything goes back to its original shape. And the whole muscle there. Um, oh, I also wanted to point out here at the beginning um, they're highlighting a single sarcomere, and actually, it as it plays out, you can see all of these sarcomeres all contract together. That's what's happening. This is one, two, three, four, five myofibrils all bundled together within one micro, uh, muscle fiber. And all of the um, sarcomeres and all of those myofibrils are all doing the exact same thing at the exact same time, and that's what causes the contraction. There. So it's really kind of nice the way that they, they illustrate these things dynamically in you know seconds, and they can do it much more beautifully than I can explain over five minutes. Okay? So I really like these kinds of things. Um, like I said, this is the only one that's available on YouTube. Um, there are... Uh, a couple of other animations about what's happening in muscles. Um, if uh, you want to spend $100 on it, feel free. I don't suggest it. Um, if you have any friends that are taking a &P, um, from another instructor, they have the passcode to get in to see these if you want to um, ask them to show you, just to get a little bit more. This one you can watch all you want on YouTube until they discover that I'm showing it uh, in my class. Actually, I don't think they're ever going to take it down. But, um, and I'm not going to provide you the link directly. Just search for sliding filament in YouTube and play the one that's cross bridge cycle. You're welcome to play the other ones. You might want to learn how to make magic s'more squares um, or look at any of the other animations about um, sliding filaments. I do want to point out um, if you've been doing any of the makeup assignments, actually, I can't swear to this, but in some of them, I use these um, videos, this crash course system. Um, <clears throat> the guy that does this, I like it. I think he's got a kind of neat style uh, and presentation. Interesting side note, um, he and his brother both do this. He does science, his brother does history. His brother is the author of the book, Fault in Our Stars, which was made into movies recently. I never realized that, but he had some video where he's talking about the book he wrote. And I'm like, whoa, he wrote that. Um, so apparently he's a, a tween-aged girl, too. But um, uh, anyways, they both have a really interesting presentation style. I kind of like watching their videos. And so one of the brothers does a lot of uh, biology-based stuff. So here's one, again, if you search for sliding filament, which is, it's a 13 minute long video and it goes into probably more detail about the muscular system. It might be a good source for additional explanation of what's going on here. Okay. Um, and there are other things, I have not watched many of these so I don't have anything to say about them, but uh, the only one that's specifically uh, from that series that I really like is this one here. And it's obviously the only one that has the watched label in my YouTube account there. But So feel free to use those. Now, um, I am uh, glossing over a lot of things about how muscles contract and how this all works in the um, cell in the interest of time. I could sit here and keep talking, and I had sort of intended to not do so much tonight. Um, but I'm going to stop in a couple of minutes. I can certainly keep doing it, and I could spend all next week talking, too, to go into a lot of detail about all of these things. I'm, I don't have time to do that. I don't want to do that. We have other stuff to do in this unit. Um, so what I want you to do between this week and next week is 
study what's going on in the book and other sources to understand contraction. Next week, please come to me with any questions you have that you need any kind of clarification for this. Okay. Um, and you might be doing the assignments for this section. Uh, you are welcome to do the one, two, and three, part one, two, and three assignments and leave part four until after next week. Um, if you turn it in late, there's no penalty. Uh, if you do parts one, two, and three late, then of course the penalty is you have to wait for me to check them off as being late before you can go to the next part. So do parts one, two, and three over this week. Hold off on four because you only get one shot at that. Um, if you have any questions from doing those assignments, from studying any of this stuff, bring them up next week and we'll talk about them. Um, we will talk about more of this stuff and really take this information up to what's happening to the whole muscle. Um, and how we actually do work with our muscular system. That's the focus of next week, the beginning of next week's class. So that's what we'll do. Um, now, I had, again, I've said this a few times, but I had intended to yeah, um, spend a little bit more time uh, the second half tonight to kind of address lab issues. Um, <clears throat> And as far as lab material is concerned here, again, we have this second chapter that's the muscular system. And this is um, about, uh, whoops, that's not what I want. Um, <clears throat> this is about the specific muscles, their names, where they are, the anat anatomy of the system. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what I'd like to do for the lab component for which is partly this week and into next week. Um, I want you to spend a little bit of time getting to know muscles. Um, <clears throat> we don't have time to do what I would normally do, and truthfully with my night classes, I never do in the first week that we're doing this, but um, we will have more time to do this next week. And I wanna set up what I want you to be thinking about, and you're gonna have more time next week to do it. Um, what I want you to get out of looking at these muscles is to understand how muscles are attached to the skeleton and what movements they cause, what actions they're responsible for when they contract. Okay. So I start off by saying what movements they cause, I think. Um, and that's sort of harkening back to what we were talking about, yes, it was a couple weeks ago, but when we talked about joints, I also mentioned movement terms a reflection, extension, that kind of thing. So if we're talking about a muscle like the biceps brachii, it's attached at the shoulder and just past the elbow. When it contracts, it pulls one attachment point towards the other attachment point, and it causes flexion of the elbow. The triceps brachii, which is on the other side of the arm, is attached near the sh shoulder and just past the elbow, but on the posterior side of the arm. When it contracts, it causes extension of the elbow. Okay. So what I'm going to ask each of you to do is to um, get to know a particular muscle in some detail. Um, so if you go into the Blackboard stuff, so this is the current week's material. These are the assignments that have to do with muscle anatomy. Um, and like I said, work on one, two, and three this week. You can get started on four. Don't submit it because if there are any questions that you have, feel free to bring those to class next week and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> and then a link to the animation I started with earlier. There's also a link here. I forgot to point this out. I noticed it during the break. Um, just like the tissue slides that you guys collected, I captured images of the three different types of muscle tissue. Um, CS at the end of any of these means cross-section, LS means longitudinal section. The three pictures we looked at earlier that were from the book, those were all longitudinal sections, cut kind of along the length of a muscle. Okay. So this is uh, a longitudinal section of skeletal muscle. Um, it's not stained as well as the one that's in the book, but it's an example of that. Um, <clears throat> There's a cross section of skeletal muscle right next to that. Um, this is it. 
I don't know why it says 40V there. I think I meant 40X. And I don't know why this other one isn't uh, um, <clears throat> labeled as 10X, but whatever. Um, so there are a couple of cross sections there. Um, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle. Um, this is actually longitudinal and up here, smooth muscle cross section there. It, I apparently didn't label these that well, but there's enough information that is, you know, basically what you're looking at. Um, so that can supplement the material that's in the book. I forgot I had that link in there, but it, that's available. Um, if you go to next week's folder, which is oh my, week nine called musculature, um, the reading link is to the exact same chapter. Okay. What we're doing this week and next week is all one chapter. The assignments that you have in here are now called muscle physiology parts one, two, three, and four, as opposed to muscle anatomy parts one, two, three, and four. It just sort of split the assignments up that way. But it's all about the chapter material. Um, at the bottom of this, uh, <clears throat> there's an assignment link here called muscle video upload. And that's what the point of the lab material for this section is. Um, Next week, uh, we're going to concentrate on this video assignment. Okay. Um, it's due the following week. Okay, so um, you'll get everything you need to understand to to work on the video. You'll have time to work on it next week, uh, but you need to submit a final version next week, and it is a graded assignment. Uh, I'll explain that a little bit more in a sec and in a lot more depth next week. Um, but that's sort of what we're working towards for the lab components, the additional lab assignment for the muscle injury. Um, now, I have here a link. It says muscle videos, but in fact, there's only one video here. Um, what I've always intended, and it's never quite worked any semester I've done this, I've always intended you're going to submit these videos, okay? and I'm going to put them in this folder so everybody can see them. You're each going to do a video about a particular muscle. Okay? I want each of you to spend some time getting to know one muscle in some detail, but then you're going to be able to see everybody else's video because they've got to know their muscle in some detail. So you can see what they learn through their video, et cetera, et cetera. That's always been the plan. It's never worked out. So the only video in here is mine. Um, and I put this in here as an example, okay? So let me play this for you. Um, <clears throat> you can download it. Oh, shoot. Um, oh, good. Um, you can download it if you want to watch it yourself. I'm going into the downloads folder on this computer because I've downloaded it before, and I'm not going to download it again. Uh, so let me play this baby. Oh, stupid, stupid windows. The biceps brachii is located here. The origin is into the scapula. The insertion is into the radius. When it contracts, it causes flexion of the elbow. The antagonist muscle is the triceps brachii. When it contracts, it causes extension of the elbow. Okay. That's an example of a video. And actually, the more times I watch that, the more I want to redo it. And I probably will. Um, because I left out a few things that I really should have put in here. Um, for the muscle video, uh, you're going to be assigned, or you're going to have a particular muscle to work on. Okay. And what I need you to do is name and point to that muscle, like I did. I said it's the biceps brachii, and I showed where it was. If I were re to redo my version, I would actually say it's in the anterior arm. I'd like a little bit more uh, information than just it's there. Um, <clears throat> Uh, second, uh, you need to indicate the origin of the muscle. 
and name and point to that. A muscle is attached to bone at either end. One end is called the origin, and the other end is called the insertion. So as I was talking about the biceps brachii, its origin is in the shoulder, and its insertion is just past the elbow in the lower arm. Okay, So <clears throat> I want you to provide that information also. Um, and then uh, I need you to indicate its action, both uh, provide the name and demonstrate that action. And this is really why it's a video assignment. Okay, To understand what muscles do, you have to do it. You have to show what it is. And, you know, it's just the best way to do it. Um, so I expect you to do that. And then finally, um, there's the antagonist or antagonists, which you need to name, point to, and demonstrate their movement also. Okay. You've probably heard the word antagonist before. What does it mean? Yeah. Usually you hear it in re reference to like a book. There's the protagonist, the main character, the guy wearing the white hat. And then there's the antagonist, the bad guy wearing the black hat. Okay. Um, it's the character that's against the hero in the story. Okay. An antagonist muscle is a muscle that does the opposite of whatever muscle you're talking about. So I was talking about the biceps brachii, which flexes the elbow. Its antagonist, since it flexes the elbow, its antagonist must extend the elbow. And that's the triceps brachii. Okay. Um, so I demonstrated that. Now, sometimes there can be multiple agonists for a muscle. It might be because there are multiple muscles that do the same thing that is the opposite of what a muscle does. Or it might be um, that the muscle does several different actions and therefore it has several different antagonists against each of those actions. Okay. Um, so I did this example with the biceps brachii, kind of my go-to example muscle. If I'd done it for the triceps brachii, I said here's the triceps brachii on the posterior arm, its origin is in the uh, area of the shoulder, its insertion is just past the elbow uh, in the Ulna, I think. Um, <clears throat> when it contracts, it causes extension of the elbow. Its antagonists are the biceps brachii, the brachioradialis, and the brachialis muscles, all of which cause flexion of the elbow. Okay. Now, when I'm doing the biceps brachii, I only mention one antagonist because there's really only one muscle to mention. There are a couple of other muscles that also cause flexion of the elbow. So if I'm talking about the triceps brachii, it's going to have all of those muscles that flex the elbow as antagonists. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. So um, what I, oh, yes. Are you going to assign those muscles to us, or do we do that on our own this week for um, More of you are going to do it on your own. Okay. Um, actually, yeah, kind of, totally. Uh, <laughs> for the, the assignment. Now, what I would normally do in classes that I have more time, whether it's a separate lab, lab from lecture or my day hybrid classes have a longer running time, what I would normally do at this point is have you do a run-through of this with, a mus with one muscle. Okay? And I would assign that muscle. Okay? That's just sort of a rough draft just to see if you get the point of what I'm getting at here. Um, and I'd have you do that. You'd show me the video that you made. And when I say that's a good video, you get to leave for the night. It's not possible to do that in 25 minutes. Um, so I'm not going to have you do that. So what I want you to do for this coming week is try your hand at making a video. Okay? You're not going to submit that video. I'm not going to share it online with anybody else. It's a rough draft. It's your first attempt. You might seem, it might seem very silly. 
I want you to show me that video that you've made over the coming week when you get to class next week. Okay. If you're in before 5.30, I might be able to watch it before class, or it might be that I'll watch it after we finish the lecture part for next week. Um, I'm going to assign each of you a particular muscle to do that with, okay, just so we don't have to sit here and have everybody figure out what muscle they're going to do. You're going to do this video so I can watch next week. Also, think about the video you're going to turn in for the assignment. You get to choose which video, you, which muscle you want to do for that. You are going to tell me which muscle you want to do for the uh, assigned video next week. But only one person can do any given muscle. Okay. So I'm going to randomly go through the class and say, okay, what muscle did you pick? Okay. So if Christina's first, she's going to get to pick whatever muscle she wants. Okay. If Bridget's last, she's going to have to pick from what's left over. Okay. So have multiple options because your, your primary pick might get picked by somebody else. And I'm going to do it completely randomly in my attendance app pulls up people randomly like I did for the tissue stuff. Okay. So be prepared for that next week. I'm going to ask you to choose which muscle you're going to do for the video assignment itself. Okay. Um, let me think here. So, any questions about what I've set up here before I get into talking about what you're going to do for next week? Any questions about the video thing? Okay. So.